Welcome to the Healthcare Security Cast, the podcast dedicated to healthcare security, safety, and emergency management. If you are involved with a healthcare security program or desire to be, this podcast is for you. Join the conversation as we discuss the issues that matter to healthcare security professionals while leveraging the expertise of healthcare security thought leaders and experts in personal development. And now, here's your host, Brian Hamilton. Welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Security Cast. Today, I'm joined by Christian Strike. Christian, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Cool opportunity. Yeah, you're very welcome. Now, uh, we'll start off by learning a bit about you. I, I've known you for a few years, but I'm, I'm guessing most who are watching or are listening you know, may not may not know you. So who is Christian Strike? Uh, it seems like such a loaded question. Who is Christian <laughs> Strike? Um, so Christian is the CEO, uh, founder of Vigilant Security Services. It's a security agency here in Ontario. Um, not sure if your followers are, are all over Canada. I imagine that they are. Uh, so here we are in Ontario, Southern Ontario specifically, but now we're South of Toronto, where uh, our office is located in, in Kitchener. Uh, Christian Strike is a father. I have two kids and, uh, and I love spending as much time with them as I can outside of work. I'm also an instructor with Stay Safe Instructional Programs, uh, where I facilitate advanced crisis management um, advanced criminal code, use of force theory, active and compliant handcuffing, uh, which is how to handcuff someone following your directions, how to take someone down to the ground safely and effectively, um, who's not. And then we have expandable baton training programs and sharp edge weapons defense programs that are um, extremely important for healthcare environments specifically. So yeah, that's that's just a little bit about me and, and who I am. I'm, I'm uh, I'm a security guard, uh, and I'm uh, and I'm a family man. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for uh, for giving us that insight as to who you are. Now, I want to talk a bit about your career and you know what led to you starting your own company. So, I guess let let's start off with uh, your early experiences in the security industry. Sure. So, like many, I became a security guard when I was young. I was only eighteen when I got my security guard license. Uh, back then, things were a bit different. The security guard license was actually owned by the agency that you worked for. It was not owned by the individual like it is today. Uh, so I walked into um, G4S and I applied to be a security guard and uh, they did the paperwork for me. I, and, uh, you know, before, uh, just, just shortly after my 18th birthday, not long after, uh, I became a security guard and, and I've been a security guard ever since. So I did that because I wanted to use it as a stepping stone of policing. Like many people who joined the industry, uh, I wanted to gain as much life experience as I could. And I thought that maybe it would give me a leg up from there. I, I built a career out of it um, and decided that this was where I wanted to stay uh, rather than pursuing a career in policing. Yeah, for sure. So, so you started off as a security guard and then, yeah. Um, so, so obviously you, you, you would have moved into other roles during that time. Like when I, 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 like I mentioned, I've known you for a few years. I think that when I met you, you were working as an operations manager, but yeah, some of, some of the roles that you filled when, uh, you know, throughout your career. Sure. Yeah. So, so I started as a security guard working in parking lots and factories and very, uh, very basic low risk kind of environments. Uh, and I begged my supervisors for more action. I begged them for, uh, for more adrenaline type, type posting. So, uh, I was eventually moved downtown London, which is where I'm from London, Ontario. They moved me downtown London to Covent Garden market, market square, commonly referred to as kind of, I guess, London's worst, uh, or heaviest crime area, worst corner, uh, which is the corner of Dundas and Richmond or DNR for short. Uh, so I worked on that intersection of DNR for a while, and and that's where I got to learn um, how to deal with some of the people in our community that are considered undesirable on their properties, right? Um, some of our homeless population, IV drug users, uh, some of the people that security guards commonly interact with uh, that, that the majority of property owners want removed from their property. They don't like those people loitering or hanging out. From there, I went on and I worked with uh, Securitas and I took a position uh, doing mobile patrol. Really fun opportunity. Uh, it was a, 
a very large uh, community kind of area, condo, 14 acre condo property that asked to have um, daily mobile patrol. And, and we responded to calls from residents uh, that had concerns. They were suspicious people or they had experienced a theft or something else, noise disturbance, that kind of stuff. So um, I, I tried my hand at that for a little while. I really enjoyed it. And then I eventually moved on and I did loss prevention. And I did not enjoy loss prevention on a personal note. Uh, for me, I much prefer to be in uniform. So, uh, and I don't enjoy shopping either. So walking around and playing clothes for 12 hours and pretending to shop while arresting people for theft uh, was just not the right position for me. What I do next, I did executive protection for a little while. I got to meet some really cool people. Uh, I worked with Al Gore and Chris Hadfield, the Canadian astronaut, and uh, George St. Pierre, uh, Rick and Kelly from American Restoration. I think that they were probably my favorite clients I ever worked with. Uh, the people from West Coast Customs and all kinds of all kinds of really neat, really neat people. Ice Tea and Coco, some some musicians, some actors, all kinds of stuff like that. Al Gore, of course, was probably one of the most well known uh, clients I ever did with executive protection, and that was a really neat opportunity getting to see kind of how the movies of uh, what it's like inside the White House is very similar to real life, right? You'd, You'd pick up Al Gore first thing in the morning and, and there'd be a crowd of people outside of uh, his hotel room. And as soon as the door opened, he didn't stop to greet anyone. He just, he had a purpose and he would walk straight to the elevator and there's a crowd of people following him behind them. And, and, you know, oh, sir, here's the morning paper and here's what's happening in, across the world and et cetera. Really neat opportunities to see this kind of stuff. Um, from there, I eventually found my happy place in healthcare. So I became a security guard at a hospital using all this kind of experience and uh, and built on it to provide security services in, in, in that environment. Uh, and then I became a supervisor of security for a hospital. And I eventually, I did that for several years before I eventually was promoted. I became an operations manager uh, with a local security company out of Kitchener here. And I eventually oversaw three different hospitals for them. And kind of at the peak of that position, I had about 500 staff. So um about uh, 300 security guards uh 150 paramedics and 50 private investigators something like that um from there i i decided that i wanted to found my own security agency um it's not a fancy story like many entrepreneurs i did a job for a long time and then i decided one day you know what i think i can do this myself and i think maybe i can do it even better uh, and that's where Vigilant Security was born. Excellent. And yeah, so I'll say this. I've been following Vigilant since you, you know, I think pretty much since you founded it on on LinkedIn. So you've, you know, you, you have some really good branding. Uh, the one thing, too, that I've always appreciated when I've seen people that work for you, whether it was with Vigilant or in other places, they were always uniformed very well. You you, you always made sure that they, you helped, you upheld very professional standards. And I know training something that's very important for you as well. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on was just to highlight that because, you know, again, especially being a, um, you know, more of a local company, uh, you, I guess you have a lot of flexibility to make sure that, you know, people are trained the way that you want them trained. Uh, but, but I think it's a really important piece and I don't see that it gets emphasized enough uh, you know, with, with some with some security companies. So it, it's good to see that there is a, a local service provider who's doing this. And again, the professionalism is, you know, uh, kind of next level, I'll say. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. That is definitely our goal. Uh, you know, our, our, our vision at Vigilant is to redefine the standard of both a security provider and employer uh, characterized by innovation uh, compassion and professionalism. That's kind of our company slogan, our vision, our mission statement. Uh, we want to make sure that when clients hire a vigilant security guard, it doesn't matter if it's for healthcare um, at one of our hospitals or if it's a social housing, uh, could be at a retail store like we were just talking about uh, before we went on the air here. Uh, we want to make sure that clients can expect the same level of quality day after day. Something that I noticed was missing from from the industry, from my perception, was continuity. People would hire a security guard from an agency, and one day they would get a security guard that was fantastic. He was perhaps uh, a police foundations graduate and, and took great pride in, in wearing his uniform well. And the next day they would get someone who 
was only in the job because it was an easy job to get. They didn't take pride in their uniform. Uh, they didn't take pride in their appearance and they didn't have that same drive to do well, right. Or be a high performer. Uh, so you, you get, you know, you, you never know what you're going to get when you work with some of those security companies where, you know, I, I, I hired security and, and one day I got Tom and Tom was great. And the next day I got Tim and Tim was terrible. And gosh, tomorrow, I really hope Tom's coming back. Right. So we <laughs> wanted to, uh, we wanted to make sure that if you hire a visual and security guard, you get that, that level of continuity that was missing. So you get that same level of quality day after day. And that's kind of the challenge with, with, as we've grown, uh, it's the challenge with growing a security agency to maintain that level of quality, especially with the staffing issues that exist in our industry, uh, while also taking on more clients. And uh, it's, it's, it's a tough process for sure, but we're doing our best. Yeah, absolutely. Now, for, for those who are watching this conversation right now, um, you know, they're getting to experience something that the, the listeners aren't doing. That's that you're actually in uniform right now. So can you uh, yeah. can you talk to us about that? Because I know when I've spoken with you in the past, I, I've seen you in uniform before, but also seen you in the in the more business attire. So, yeah, uniform today. That's yeah, uniform right today. Uh, you know, it's common. Unless I have a business meeting with the C-suite somewhere, unless I'm going to go sit down with the vice president or, or, or CEO of, of an organization that is looking to hire Vigilant, I will often be in uniform. Reason for that, uh, I find it helpful to be able to jump in and help my employees, right? I think that as a CEO of, of a security agency, especially one our size, I wear a lot of different hats, but I think that the most important hat that I wear is leadership. Uh, it's my job to lead our staff, lead our employees. Uh, for some reason, it's, it's something that vigilant security guards actually they brag about it to their friends they like this uh they say you know the ceo of vigilant actually works with us shoulder to shoulder he he stands with us on the front line so to speak uh you won't ever see the ceo of another security agency in uniform right that's what that's the common thing that they always say uh i can't speak to that i don't know if that's true or not i'm not sure how many other owners of security agencies work in uniform uh i do actually know of a few of a couple of uh, small agencies um this is something that as we've grown, I've not uh, altered. So, of course, when we were small, I was often uniform. I was often the security guard that had to go and fill the shift uh, when somebody called last minute and said, hey, I need a guard tomorrow. No problem. I'll do it myself. Uh, as we've grown and we've gotten to a point where now we have office staff that, that handle the scheduling and handle kind of the back of the house stuff, and we have uh, enough employees that I don't have to necessarily be in uniform, I still choose to be in uniform. Uh, if there was a arrest at one of our local uh, retail stores here, like for example, Canadian Tire, uh, I would want to maybe pop over and, and check it out or visit. We, of course, talked earlier again before we went live here uh, about the hospitals. When I go visit our hospitals, I generally will do so in uniform. Uh, it's something that our clients have, have come to expect. It's normal. Uh, to see me and to see me in uniform. I want to make sure that if I'm if I'm visiting one of those hospitals, for example, and I'm visiting my staff, I want to be able to use that as a training opportunity as well. So if I'm there and there happens to be a code white in the middle of my visit, uh, I would rather be able to help restrain my staff acting as a security guard than uh, you know perhaps um, screw up my favorite suit. Uh, <laughs> you're right. So. Uh, that, that's the reason for the uniform. I like to be able to jump in and I like to uh, be able to work alongside our guards uh, kind of at the, at the front line where our value is created. Oh, excellent. And thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I could definitely appreciate that. And I can think of one uh, CEO who uh, who did wear the uniform, but uh, it was EP and the uniform was a suit anyways. Ah. <laughs> so so it's a, yeah. you know, not, not quite the same impact. No, I, I do know a couple. So it's, a, you know, the as you mentioned, Vigilant is really pushing professionalism. We're not the only ones. There are other security agencies out there in Ontario right now that are, are trying to do the same thing. And it's a small group and we all know each other, right? So there are there are a couple other CEOs across Ontario uh, that, that have the same mindset as me that uh, I would call maybe the next generation of security agency owners or security agency CEOs, kind of that new generation. Um, 
and that it seems to be a more common mentality uh, amongst my generation of ownership. Excellent. Well, yeah. as, as someone who's had very, very diverse experience in the security industry. So again, you mentioned all the different verticals that you've worked in, you know, working from a security guard to CEO of a company. Given all the different environments that you've been in, what do you find is or some of the unique challenges in the healthcare environment as compared to say retail or loss prevention? Wow. What a great question. You know, healthcare is so unique. It's, it's really a, an animal of its own, as they say, uh, you know, working in healthcare, working in healthcare as a security guard at its core is very different um, because we're actually genuinely trying to help people. Not that security guards in other environments aren't genuinely trying to help people, but uh, one of the easiest ways I think I could explain this would be to, to mention, usually when you work as a security guard, uh, you have the ability to remove someone from your property and just forget about them, right? If I'm working as a security guard at a mall, uh, if I'm working as a security guard at a plaza, a retail store, um, you know, a, a bar, a nightclub, whatever, if, if I have someone who causes a disturbance, who isn't following the rules, who uh, has struggles with mental health or, or addiction, uh, someone who just genuinely we don't want around, uh, we would send them off. Uh, we would remove them from the property. We can use force if we have to, to do that. And as soon as they're gone, we kind of forget about them. Working in a healthcare environment is a totally different animal for that reason, because you can't just send people packing, right? We're there um, to genuinely try and help these people. If someone's yelling and screaming uh, and causing a disturbance and throwing things, sure, there are times if you're an outpatient in the emergency department and, and the issue you came in for is not life or limb, we can still treat it the same as working at a mall and we can send you packing on your way. But if you were there for a life or limb issue or you're an inpatient, uh, generally security guards have the challenge of having to learn how to manage those behaviors versus just removing the person and forgetting about them. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Now, from the standpoint of a, of a professional, so just from your, your own point of view, you, you know, you said you found that you found your happy place when you got into healthcare. So yeah. what was it about healthcare that drew you in? Oh, again, I think it's those challenges uh, of exactly that, what I just described, right? So first of all, of course, working with clinical staff, I really love that. Uh, you know, the, mercy, the nurses in the emergency department at two o'clock in the morning have their own sense of humor and, and it's a fun uh, environment to work in, as you know. And it is a very challenging environment to work in. There's Once you've been working at a mall as a security guard for long enough, that routine could maybe become boring or tedious, right? Uh, removing a trespasser, removing a trespasser over and over. I never experienced that working in a healthcare environment. Uh, every day is a little bit different. Every person brings their own new challenges. Uh, and it keeps it exciting. It keeps it, it keeps it fresh. Also working as a security guard in a healthcare environment, I felt more like I was given the opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. Similar to, you know, being a 911 responder, you know, police, fire, EMS, uh, where those people get the opportunity to go home at the end of the day and, and some days feel like, you know what, I, I did a good thing today. I saved a life. I uh, made a difference in someone's life, et cetera. Working as a, I'll call it first responder, within a healthcare facility uh, gives you that same opportunity, right? When there's uh, when there's a code white in the hospital and there's a violent person, when there's uh, anything from, you know, a code aqua being a flood or a, uh, a code green, an evacuation, a code red, a fire, any of these types of things that we experience in healthcare environments, the security guards are the first responders in those types of environments. And you, have the opportunity to genuinely feel like you've made a difference in someone's day and people's lives. Uh, all the different patients that over the years I had the opportunity to interact with, um, of course, some were positive interactions and some were negative interactions uh, where perhaps I had to restrain or arrest a person. Uh, that's not something that I want to have to do, but I would frequently be able to build a rapport with those people, get a better understanding of how they ended up in the position that they're in and sometimes we get the opportunity to help them. You definitely feel rewarded at the end of the day. 
And I got a lot of that working in healthcare compared to some of the other things that I did. Absolutely. Now, as a business owner, especially being in Ontario, it is tough to crack the healthcare market uh, as a new company. You know, yeah. unless you're one of the handful of companies that are already in a hospital, sure. they're generally looking for a company who has a lot of experience that they can that they can reflect on. So, for yourself, and if correct me if I'm wrong here, but you're you're currently in two health, healthcare facilities, correct? We're in two, and we were just about to add a third. Awesome. Okay. So, and, and again, knowing that healthcare was kind of your sweet spot, when you got that first contract, what was what was that like? What was that like for you? Oh, that was exciting. Yeah, that was really really exciting you know at that time vigilant was still so young that the the company's phone was my personal cell phone we didn't have office lines yet then and i'll always remember where i was you know i i don't think i could actually take any other client and remember where i was the moment i got that call no offense to those clients uh but it was specifically when i got the phone call from our client contact for uh, the, you know, the first hospital that we took over, I was standing in a parking lot at Costco. I always remember that. Uh, <laughs> I was loading, uh, you know, groceries and things into the back of my car. And I took that phone call on my cell phone. And, and I think I probably stood in the parking lot there for about an hour talking to this gentleman and, and just explaining, uh, they had never had security before at this healthcare facility. Uh, this was new for them. Uh, he had called several companies looking for, uh, someone that could, you know, meet their demands, which now at this time we've, we've evolved the program into 24 seven coverage, but at the time they were just looking for guards to work 11 PM to 7 AM overnight, uh, to help when, you know, there are less people in the building and provide a little bit more safety specifically for, uh, you know, the, the clinical staff of the emergency department and, and the few inpatient units they had at that facility. So, uh, I, I guess I talked the talk. I, I sounded like I knew what I was talking about and I explained how I thought we could help and, and what I thought they needed, uh, explained how, uh, I had created similar programs in the past, uh, in previous positions that I had. And, and it wasn't long before they signed a contract with us and, and the rest is history. We added a second hospital from that, um, same healthcare, uh, alliance, uh, or a, uh, is it yeah alliance i think that's right that's the right terminology uh and uh and it's just grown from there so yeah it's been a rare opportunity and i recognize that right away as soon as we got it i remember going home to my wife and being so excited oh my gosh we got a hospital uh because i knew how rare that was right the previous company i had worked for where i got that opportunity to work uh in healthcare had been in business for over 20 years before they finally got their first hospital uh, for us, we were in business for one year before we picked up our first hospital. So that was really exciting. That was a very rare opportunity. And and I seized it quickly because, uh, as you said, right, generally the only companies working in healthcare are, you know, G4S, Garda, Paladin um, and and then the odd uh, company that has about 500 staff. Certainly, I would suggest we're probably the smallest company. Uh, that's currently under contract with with healthcare facilities. Now, uh, thanks to the experience I got before I started Vigilant, I guess. Yeah, awesome stuff. Now, you know, this is totally unrelated, but you didn't happen to have any frozen food in that uh, in that Costco run, did you? I probably did. Yeah, I, you know, I probably did uh, some frozen chicken nuggets or something. But you know what? <laughs> that sales call was more important in that moment uh, than most chicken nuggets. Of course. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. And you've been able to grow it. And, and obviously being someone who, who worked it for so long, understanding the unique challenges of the environment, what was the, what was the approach that you've taken to preparing your frontline staff to work in these facilities? Mm, so we rely heavily on stay safe instructional programs. Um, I, I know you're probably familiar with Steve Somerville. Uh, uh -huh. You know, I think this entire industry is uh, at this point. So at the time, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll kind of speak to how I ended up there. So uh, we ran a team at a, at a local a hospital in, in Kitchener of about 200 beds. So a, a decent sized hospital. And we were consistently using retired police officers for our use of force training. And we were running into some issues with uh, the training that those officers or retired officers were providing was geared for police officers more than it was geared for security guards 
some of the things they taught our guards were actually incorrect, where they would teach our security guards to make arrests under Section 495 of the Criminal Code versus 494. 495 being that peace officer authority to make an arrest and, and 494 being a civilian's authority to make an arrest. So, um, you know, some of the stuff we were learning was was just flat out not correct. And, and we needed to find uh, a better solution. And so it, someone mentioned to me the name Steve Somerville. I should look up that name. Uh, so I did. I Googled the name Steve Somerville and I came across Stay Safe Instructional Programs and I reached out. And not long later, I think it was only a month or two later, they were running an instructor's program, a train the trainer program. And so I attended that and it was life changing for me. It genuinely was. Uh, and, and I really, I do say that genuinely. You know, I often thought as a young security guard in my early 20s, I was good at managing people in crisis. And, and now I know we, we usually call that an unconscious expert. I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know how to articulate myself the same way that Stay Safe taught me how to do it. Uh, I knew that I was reasonably good in what we commonly refer to as occurrences, uh, which now I would I would refer to as generally generally a person in crisis. Um, but I would call the the Stay Safe programs, the crisis management program, the effective communication program, as a roadmap to how to manage those occurrences. And that was a roadmap I didn't have before. I was just doing what I was doing based on experience alone. Uh, the training really helped me develop me as a person, even though if, you know, at that point I had already had about 10 years in as a security guard, uh, I was learning all kinds of new stuff that I'd, I'd never heard of or didn't know about. So, you know, we did advanced crisis management. We identify the four different stages of crisis that a person goes through, uh, the appropriate responses to those stages of crisis. Uh, and it's very much geared for security guards here in Ontario, right? Some, some security companies, some people like to rely on that, um, CPI program, uh, NVCI, right? Nonviolent crisis, uh, nonviolent crisis intervention, uh, which is put on by CPI, the Crisis Prevention Institute. Uh, and not a lot of people know that actually that program is American. It's not Canadian. And it was developed for teachers to manage children with autism. Not suggesting for a second it's a, it's a bad program. I'm just suggesting uh, there are other programs that exist that cover that same material and may actually be suited specifically for Ontario and specifically for our healthcare environment. Uh, from there, we did all the, the the advanced criminal code stuff, you know, some stuff I'd never heard of before, where uh, some processes I'd never heard of before, I should say, where we now require our security guards to write a criminal code test. Uh, they have to get a minimum score of 75%, similar requirement that's required of police officers that attend the Ontario Police College. Uh, the test is taken from there, right? Steve Somerville, of course, was um, formerly uh, an instructor, a chief tactical instructor at the Ontario Police College. So, uh, you know, the, much of the material is similar uh, that we now teach to our security guards is what police officers are taught at OPC here in Ontario. Uh, the physical skills stuff, of course, as well, much more in depth. You know, one thing I'll mention is there are training programs out there that uh, will cover, as so they say, crisis management, criminal code, handcuffing, uh, and baton in an eight hour day, right? Uh, I, you know, I, I won't mention the names of those programs. So I, I don't believe in them. Uh, it takes me as an instructor or any other stay safe instructor, uh, a minimum of three days to do that, that same material, you know, crisis management and criminal code is a day by itself. I should say crisis management, effective communication and criminal code is a day by itself. Um, handcuffing is a day by itself where we also do resistance management theory or use of force theory. Uh, we cover the resistance management wheel. We, we teach security guards how to, um, look at a subject's profile behavior and, and make decisions in accordance with that, uh, with different appropriate response options. That's another day. And then of course, baton, that's another day on its own as well. We go in depth, not just in how to swing a stick, uh, but the seven components of power how to generate power, uh, et cetera. So those, those training programs are, and I feel like I shouldn't say this because I think it's, it's part of our secret sauce. It's one of the <laughs> ingredients to our secret sauce. But uh, those training programs are very much part of the, the major key to vigilant success, both in healthcare and in social housing um, and all kinds of environments. And, and you know what? Now we're seeing contracts that are requiring stay safe as a minimum training program. They're actually naming Stay Safe and saying, hey, 
Uh, I just did a walkthrough at uh, the city of Brantford. Was it last week or the week before? And one of their requirements is that you have to have a seasoned stay safe instructor or have access to one. And all of the security guards that are assigned to that contract have to have the full lineup of stay safe courses, uh, which is pretty neat to see, right? You know, we're at a point now where our clients are holding, they know, uh, you know, they know what they didn't know before and they're holding uh, the companies accountable to make sure that, that they're meeting that, that standard. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, being a Brantford resident, that's, it's nice to hear that they're, uh, they're taking that, they're taking that seriously. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's some great stuff. Now for your team is, does everybody get the same training across the board or is there a specific training? I, I'm, I'm sure with some of the clients, there is some different training, but mm -hmm. I guess in theory, if someone is, has been working in retail and then all of a sudden, you know, they, they want to work at one of your healthcare facilities, they're successful in that application and you send them there. Is there any other additional training that they have to go through or is it just really the site training at that point? Yeah, great question. Uh, so we split up our security guards in what we call tier one and tier two. So tier one represents a very small number, a uh, small volume of our business. Only about 30% of our business this year has been tier one work. Tier one is what I would refer to as what 99% of other security agencies in Ontario supply. Uh, and that is your entry level security guard that just did the security guard course and they walked into a security company and they were handed a uniform and, and sometimes they were told, Hey, you can start today. We've got an open shift tonight. Can you work tonight? Here's your uniform. Off you go. Uh, you know, now we don't hire like that, but the, the training of those security guards is limited to just the security guard course. We do require that they maintain their valid first aid and CPR. If that expires, they're placed on an ad administrative suspension until they renew it. Uh, and you know that's it. Other than that, you have site specific training. So it's it's just basic. Those security guards are used for construction sites generally. Uh, they're used for access control. Uh, those kind of simple uh, type of positions. Those entry level positions. Uh, 60 something percent of our volume of, of work comes for our comes from our tier two security guards. So our tier two guards go through the training program I just mentioned, where they do advanced crisis management, advanced criminal code, they have to write a criminal code test, they have to achieve a minimum score. If they don't, they have to redo that, uh, that portion of the program until they're able to achieve that score. Um, we have them do the uh, the physical skills training of, of handcuffing, baton, and sharp edge weapons defense. Uh, healthcare, of course, has a little bit different stuff too. We have some training programs in Pinel restraints. Uh, so there are some training programs that are very specific to healthcare. But the neat part about the way we do it, and I guess I kind of got the idea from the Ontario Police College in that every police officer in Ontario, right? Doesn't matter if you're hired uh, for the Ottawa Police Service or Windsor Police, two different corners of the province. Uh, they all go to OPC together, right? For those same, I'm not sure, 15, 16, or 17 weeks. They all go to OPC. They all do the same level of training. Then they go back to the service that hired them, and they get into some, some specific training there. Uh, we wanted to make sure that a security guard who works in London could be partnered with a security guard who works in Kitchener. And the two of them may have never met, but they've been through the exact same training program. They've achieved a minimum level of score each. Uh, and so genuinely they, they know their stuff uh, and they're able to work alongside each other, having never met and have that confidence that, Hey, if, if you're wearing that uniform, I know what you've been through. Cause I've been through the same thing and I can be confident that you have the same minimum level of knowledge that I have. Is that fair? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that's fair. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. That was the goal. That was why we did it the way we did it. That's why I've done it that way. Uh, yeah, right. Healthcare. Yes. I could take someone who was a tier two working uh, in social housing and I could place them in a healthcare environment. There would be some additional courses uh, off the top of my head. Mental health and the law is one. It's the, that's the name of the training program. Uh, mental health and the law, as well as uh, Pinnell restraints and healthcare. Uh, that would probably be kind of the most important. Our Pinnell program, Pinnell restraint program, which is genuinely used by probably 99% of hospitals in Ontario. Uh, there's maybe one or two small hospitals that are still using posy restraints or, or even leather restraints or something other than Pinnell. But uh, 
Pennell restraints are, are pretty commonly used right across the province. And we have a training program for that, which involves both physical skills as well as a workbook and classroom portion as well. So we take a look at safe application of Pennell restraints, uh, how to apply the restraints, where to apply them, some safety considerations, and of course, the legal stuff that comes into it as well, like the Patient Restraint Minimization Act. It's important to me that my security guards are able to not only apply those physical skills, but also articulate why they did it and what authority they had to. I remember one time I had a security guard and he was so proud of himself, just as I was proud of him too. Uh, he restrained someone and a police officer uh, responded uh, to the hospital for uh, something unrelated. And he saw this person in restraints or he saw the security guard restraining in this person. This person was trying to get up, trying to leave. And the um, and he was not on a form one. He was not placed on a form. And the police officer uh, looked at the security guard and said, what authority do you have to restrain this person? And the security guard recited word for word from the Patient Restraint Minimization Act, right? Uh, you know, I have a duty to restrain or confine a person when immediate action is necessary to prevent serious bodily harm to that person or others. Uh, and the police officer just went, okay, I'll, I'll have to look into that. I had never heard of that before, right? But our security guard had the confidence and ability to articulate that. Uh, it gives them pride. You know, it gives us pride uh, when they they have that level of confidence, when they know their stuff. Uh, and it also gives them the ability to do their job effectively too. Awesome. Yeah, pretty cool. That's a great story. Now, I, I want to uh, kind of reflect on some of your experience as an entrepreneur. So as someone who started a security company, what are what are some of the things that surprised you or that you didn't anticipate or, you know, just some of the day in the life of an entrepreneur stuff? Well, I, you know, I guess when I think of the entrepreneur stuff, I really genuinely think of kind of the back of the house. Uh, I think I was I was lucky in that some things came naturally to me uh, on, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit very much runs in my family. Uh, my grandfather owned a business. Uh, both of my parents uh, actually teach business, although I didn't go to school for business. They're both university business professors. So, uh, you know, on, on a rare occasion, it, it has been helpful to be able to go to them and say, hey, uh, you know, what's the best way to achieve this or what do you think about this? Uh, and they, they genuinely they usually have answers that are far more confusing than I expected, but, uh, <laughs> it's nice to, to have that ability to have, you know, those people with, with PhDs in business to go and, and ask questions to of, uh, for me, you know, I, I'm not a businessman who had to learn security. I'm a security guard who had to learn how to be a businessman, right? I'm, I'm a professional security guard at my core. So, uh, I had to learn, a lot of it I was able to learn when I had that position as an operations manager. It was that position that really gave me the ability to, to do what I do today. I wouldn't have uh, I wouldn't have been able to go from being a security guard to owning my own security company. Uh, I just would not have had that experience to be able to do that. So, uh, you know, writing a service agreement, signing new contracts, the do's and don'ts of sales or or the customer service aspect of things, which, of course, is extremely important. Uh, all of that I learned in my time as an operations manager for, for that other, uh, reasonably sized company, medium to large size company. Um, but the things I didn't learn there that I had to learn myself, you know, were, uh, payroll. I didn't do payroll, uh, you know, having to submit payroll and, and WSIB remittances and, uh, invoicing. I never did invoicing. So figuring that out and, uh, some of the, the finer details that you don't necessarily think of, right? Uh, I dabbled in scheduling, but certainly not to the degree that, that we have now. Uh, I'm so thankful for uh, our admin assistant we were able to, to take on this year. She's she's taken a lot of that off of my plate so I can get back to focusing on the business rather than, uh, you know, being in the business, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, much of that I had to learn. I had to learn the business side of things. Uh, it's not impossible. You can learn anything on Google. Uh, you know, for example, I was talking to my, my dad, he teaches the MBA program at the Richard Ivey School of Business at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, and they have what's called an EMBA program, Executive uh, Master's Business Administration. And it was something I was genuinely interested in. I thought, you know what, I've, I've got the, uh, the security aspect of my business down, right? I, I'm, I'm a, a subject matter expert as a security guard. What I'm not a subject matter expert in is the business side of things. How do I take Vigilant? How do I, how do I make it national? 
how do I keep growing this company uh, until it's, you know, of, of a substantial size and there's a vigilant office in, in every major city in the country, right? How do I do that uh, without just, you know, winging it? How do I, how do I genuinely prepare for that? Uh, and I thought doing that EMBA would be a fantastic, uh, fantastic program. So I talked to my dad about it. And of course, it's quite an expensive program, right? It's about, it's about $100,000, $120,000 program. So quite the investment in yourself. And uh, he looked at me and said, there's none of that information that you can't find uh, on Google or elsewhere for free, right? You can all do the same courses and you can do them for free. So really what you're paying for is to get that piece of paper. And he said to me, so do you want the piece of paper? And also a big part of what you're paying for is, of course, he mentioned um, connecting with other business professionals. People who usually do EMBAs are a lot of physicians, for quite frequently, his students, he, he told me, will be, uh, you know, lifelong physicians who have taken a new position as a director uh, for a new department. And they go, well, I know how to be a doctor, but I don't know how to run or be a director for, for a department, right? So they go and do an EMBA just to learn kind of those processes of business. So do you want it for the, um, for the connecting with other professionals? Do you want to do it just for the piece of paper? Or do you want to do it for the knowledge of being able to grow your business? And well, you know, of course, I, I love the idea of connecting with, with other like-minded people. But at the core, really, I, I want it so that I can build my business. I don't, I don't need to put, you know, that I have an MBA on my LinkedIn. Uh, and so that's kind of where I've steered more now my future of education. So there's some fantastic uh, organizations out there that have a lot of free material for entrepreneurs. Uh, of course, you know, there's there's... Uh, similar courses to those you would do in an EMBA. And so and that's where I'm kind of focused now is, is learning uh, through, through some formal and informal education, uh, the things that I didn't know about business, right? You don't know what you don't know. So I have to figure all that stuff out. Awesome. And I guess uh, the, the other thing I'll ask you is just uh, future plans for vigilant security. And just for those watching, I'm just going to pop up your website here as well. So it's vigilantsecurityservices.org. That's O-R-G, vigilantsecurityservices.org. So what's what can we look forward to from vigilant security moving forward? Oh, great question. Uh, I hope that we will continue to grow. My goal would be that we continue to grow while maintaining, and I mentioned this earlier, you know, half an hour ago or something, uh, the the level of quality that we promise our clients today, right? I turn down, genuinely, I turn down more business than I accept today. Uh, and that's because if I don't think that we can do it well, I won't do it. And most security companies will accept everything that walks through the door, right? I've worked for those companies. So someone calls, says, hey, I need a guard tomorrow. Cool. Uh, I will try and find a guard tomorrow. Uh, I'll take the job no matter what. And if I can't, I'll ghost somewhere else so that I can fill that spot, right? That's ghosting is such a common thing in our industry. Uh, for me, I've learned that my reputation is more valuable than money. And when I say my, I don't mean me personally. I mean our, our organization, Vigilant, right? Vigilant has its own personality uh, as a corporation and, and Vigilant's reputation is more important than money. So if me taking on some some small job that we wouldn't be able to do properly uh, is going to hurt my reputation. I would prefer to just not take it uh, to save my reputation and and lose that little bit of money because we didn't take it right. Uh, so if that's that's kind of driver number one for me is we have to make sure that as we grow, we're going to maintain that same quality. Uh, we're going to maintain our reputation, and if we're not able to, then we need to stay the size that we're at until we're able to, to get there, right? One of my mentors back when I was an operations manager once told me, if you get too big, too fast, you go under. And he's right. Uh, you know, cash is king. You have to have the uh, equity in the business to be able to continue to grow, right? You have to have uh, the cash flow available to do it. If you get one client can sink you, right? One big client uh, who doesn't pay their bills for 120 days or something like that. Next thing you know, you're not covering payroll and then nobody's going to work for you anymore. So uh, it's important that we keep growing at a steady pace, but we don't try and get too big too quick. Uh, there's some, some companies out there locally in Ontario recently that went from having uh, 10 employees and two vehicles to 
uh, 600 employees and 50 vehicles, something like that. Um, and that company no longer exists, right? They did that over the course of like 24 months uh, or something crazy. So, you know, it's important that we grow. It's important that we're careful the way that we grow. And and the goal would be to, like I said earlier, I want to, I would like to put a vigilant office in every major city in Canada. Uh, I think that vigilant offers something different uh, that no one else has quite um, perfected yet. And I'd like to, to be able to do that all over the country uh, if we can. So awesome. Well, a little bit steady. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely be watching. And um, so I'll, you know, uh, check out Christian's website. Uh, make sure to follow him on LinkedIn, follow Vigilant Security on LinkedIn to just see see what's happening and see what's new. Uh, one last thing, Christian. So, you know, you, you've been in the business for a few years now. If you were able to go back in time and have a conversation with yourself, you know, day one, what advice would you give Christian Strike, who was just starting Vigilant Security at that point? Uh, I would tell him not to worry, uh, that it's all going to happen in time. You know, when I first started vigilant, uh, I, I had a brand new child. I had, uh, uh, you know, my, my, my wife and my first child back then we have two now, but at the time we only had the one and I, I took on all the pressure of having to support, you know, my family, uh, as well as trying to build this new business and, and I had no idea how we were going to get new clients and, and what was, you know, how, what do I need to do in sales and what kind of sales should I be doing? And that's the question I was asking everybody, you know, what do you do? Do you do cold calls, cold emails? How do you get new business? I don't understand how this works. Uh, and, you know, if I could go back, I would, I would just tell myself to relax um, that uh, if you build it, they will come, right? Focus more on that uh, professionalism, focus more on, on the training aspect of things. And when people see kind of what you do and what you're all about, they will just gravitate uh, towards you, right? If, if that's if that's what they're looking for, so. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Christian, uh, thank you for taking the time. Really enjoyed this conversation. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, other people benefited from this as well. And uh, hopefully now more people know about vigilant security and we can start working towards having a, an office in every major city in Canada. I hope. Thanks again, Breen. It was awesome uh, uh, to have this opportunity. So thank you very much.